Hi, and welcome to episode number three of FinOps Friday. This one is all about getting yourself set up and ready from a more technical perspective. So we're gonna dip our toes into the more technical side of things, don't worry. We're not gonna get into the really deep, nitty gritty operation, tactical aspects of FinOps. It's really just looking at what do you need to get set up in in terms of things like tooling, things that are a little bit more technical, what are the data sources, what you're gonna need so that you can configure your tooling, start to measure where you're at, and all those sorts of activities later down the track. So today we've got Sarah Hassani with us, who yes, is an Abdio employee. She's worked with many, many customers, getting them set up, configuring tooling, helping them to sort of bootstrap their FinOps journey to get them walking and eventually to get them running as well. So Sarah, quick introduction. How have you been working with our customers and what have you been doing to getting them set up? Thanks for the introduction, excited to be here today. So uh, I've been working with clients for a few years now, building out their FinOps use cases, um, using tooling to help get them visibility into their data analytics, um, what they're spending, how they're using the cloud, um, and understanding some of their future goals to align and help them you know, optimize that spend and ensure that they are you know, spending and utilizing their resources in an efficient manner. Awesome, awesome. And we'll get onto a few of those things in a minute. So first off, let's talk about data sources. Obviously, there is an enormous amount of data that you can use to be able to be effective and that you simply have to use to make those business decisions. You need the information. You're going to need an immense amount of data. Cloud is great at being able to give you so much data to be effective. So in order to take the right decisions and implement the right actions, you've gonna have to have the information and data. One of your first steps in your FinOps journey is to make sure that you've configured your data sources so you're collecting all of that data. Sarah, what are some of the different sources of this data and information that are required? What have you been seeing customers use? Sure, yeah, we definitely one thing that is really gonna be critical is cloud billing data will give you the visibility into what you're spending, um, what what is you know driving that spend, also you know utilization data sources as well. Um, I can name a few like data sort, um, Datadog, New Relic, CloudWatch. These are the type of uh, utilization data sets that will help you understand how you're spent, how you're utilizing the cloud, and when you're utilizing the cloud. Um, that way, the more you understand about you know, the utilization, the better choices you can make to operate better and more efficiently. Excellent. And in terms of one of the things I love to push customers to really start to look at, not just the the technical operation of, of, of the resources in the workload, but their actual usage of the workloads. You know, what are their customers doing? How many, you know, requests, things like that. Are you seeing a lot of customers doing that or are they sort of starting to do that? Like obviously it's very, each workload's gonna be different in terms of the data it has, the format of the data, it's gonna be a hard task. Are a lot of customers tackling that challenge and getting actual workload, customer usage data of their workloads in as well? Yes, I think this is, um, you know, really good way to get the insights in to then better understand, you know, for example, things like containerization, get insights into like spot usage. Um, these type of things will really help you optimize your, your spend. Yep, awesome. Uh, and what about some of the really non-technical data sources like that an organization typically has, you know, things like the number of features that they're rolling out from their teams, uh, the operational effort, after hours, on-call hours. Are a lot of customers really implementing and using those within their FinOps practices as well? Absolutely. You know, I always say it's really important to identify the tasks that need to happen to operate effectively in the cloud. And in addition to, you know, managing the tasks that need to happen, you want to also track who's doing what, tracking the timelines, making sure these are happening within the right time that, you know, things need to happen in. Um, You know, also we do see people putting in like internal policies around, um, you know, this is how you launch an instance and, and things like that. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Yep, awesome. As we sort of had with um, Maddie in the previous episode, you know, cloud is really going to be a cultural change. So measuring all aspects of your organization is really going to be key as well. Um, when customers don't have the data sources, when they don't have enough of that information to make decisions, 
Um, what do you start to see in customers? Like what happens to them? To them. It's, yeah, it's definitely tough. I mean, one area that we see this happen in specifically is tagging. Um, a lot of people are just launching into the cloud and, and they don't have that, um, that visibility, for example. Um, and, you know, it's tough. There, there are, you know, ways you can get around it. There are tools today, like, that can help you develop synthetic, like, synthetic layers of tagging, like, things like business mappings and conditions you can apply to kind of go in after the fact. Um, so there are workarounds that are happening uh, if, if it's not happening at the foundational level. Yep, awesome. And for uh, those we're going to get to tagging in a little bit, a tag is the way that you overlay your business information onto your billing information. Um, so you're starting to see things like an increase in operational overhead. You didn't have the data to begin with. Now you're going to have to sort of put that in place and rewrite it and sort of go back and fix up all the mistakes. So there's obviously a lot of operational overhead. Do you start to see a lot of friction within the teams as well that they're, they're trying to run, but then they're being pulled back, things like that? Absolutely, yes. I mean, you, you'll see some people have different um, theories on how to go in. You know, some people say progress, not perfection. Just get it in there. And then you have other people that are like, you know, no, I want to do this right. And maybe they're, they're walking or a lot slower. So the people that want to crawl and run. So there is definitely some friction around that. Yep. Um, in terms of what are going to be your top list, if you to put in the, the sources of information in order, like what would be the top ones, you know, things like obviously your, your actual cloud billing data, cost and usage information would be number one. Things like organizational information for tagging, what would be that sort of list of, of really critical items? Good question. So, like you mentioned, absolutely cost and utilization data is for, you know, forefront number one. Um, number two, um, you know, any organizational needs like hierarchies, for example, understanding the layers that are required in your organization to show back those costs. Um, also, if you have any CMDB data where you're having um, you know, applications that need to be deployed in the cloud, you know, putting that data forefront as well. And coming up with a, you know, and I, I might, you might hear me say this a lot, and I know we're going to get to tagging, but I, I really do think tagging is the key foundational, you know, source that should happen to get a good foundation in the cloud and have good visibility. So, you know, any mandatory tagging um, data sets would also be in my top as well. Yeah, excellent. Um, and, and I mean, you put emphasis on tagging, rightly so. It's the number one pain customers have. Uh, without tagging, you can't ask business questions of your data. It's just irrelevant. You can't turn data information without that relevance to the business. And that is all done through tagging. So absolutely get your tagging in place. Uh, we're going to move on to an account structure. Uh, so a lot of different um, cloud service providers have an account or a project structure, which is sort of the, the default underlying division between things. Um, so there's sort of the de facto way to provide separation and things like allocation of costs. Early on, it was somewhat difficult to get communication between different accounts. Uh, as uh, the cloud service providers matured, there's a lot more services and a lot more features that made that easier, that communication a lot easier to build um, so, and aggregate the information across that as well. So you've got to distribute, but then you need to aggregate it and build it back up. In terms of an account structure, uh, what are the good components of an account structure that you've seen? Yeah, I think um, it, I think if you ask different people, they'll probably have different answers. For me, um, I personally think, you know, there are some different ways that you can be most successful. I personally think separating out account structures by environment can be really uh, good practice, right? Um, because having that account structure by environment can allow you later to optimize more effectively. Also. Um, you know, a lot of people do like to do the shared account structure. Um, one thing I, I recommend when going in that shared account structure is to think about how you will be optimizing later um, and understanding the needs of your finance teams to kind of allocate those costs later. For example, you know, you're going to be buying reserved instances at an account level. And if you're going to be having multiple shared cost centers, you know, 
kind of thinking about that um, if you have the ability to separate out cost centers um, into different account structure accounts I definitely recommend that as well um, and then also if you know you have initiatives dividing them out by initiative could also be helpful but I, I do think that this you might get different answers from from different people but this is something that I believe can be helpful is really dividing it out by you know how you plan to allocate the costs later could be really helpful down the line when going to optimize. Excellent. Uh, and the, the challenge is, you know, if you get it wrong and you need more accounts, you're going to have to move workloads between accounts, which can be a big operational overhead. So the next question is, you know, what is the right number of accounts to an organization? I think Maddie again, covered this depending on the complexity of the organization. Well, I guess you could say, depending on the complexity of the workloads, if you've got 10 different workloads for 10 different departments and each of them has staging production, that's going to drive a large number of accounts. Is there a way that somebody can say like, this is the right number of accounts for you? What are customers sort of gravitating towards in, in terms of number and size and complexity? You know, like Maddie mentioned, it really is specific to the complexity of the organization. I do recommend, however, um, you know, I think the right number is really going to be covering the, you know, requirements of your organization, right? So for example, some organizations, they, different industries have different requirements of what can be in the same account, right? Um, so I really do think this is a tough one. I don't know if there is any right number, but I do believe in, um, you don't want to have account structure that doesn't make sense, right? So whether in your organization it makes sense to do this at a cost owner level or at an environment level, really making that assessment and then going from there. Um, perfect uh, introduction to who's involved. So who are the people that need to be involved? You know, you sort of mentioned people like security, you, you can't have production and non-production data sitting together. That's gonna to be a big no-no. A great way to separate that is by different accounts. Um, so what are gonna be the main teams involved uh, in helping to determine what are gonna be those policies and drivers to the account structure? Yeah, so oftentimes we do see that, you know, this goes to like a DevOps type of team where we have architects involved, we have database, um, you know, database engineers involved. This isn't the most traditional path, but I also like to have some exposure from people in, like you said, also as well, security, absolutely. Security needs to be involved as well. Um, and also um, having some feedback from, if you have this developed already, some type of cloud business office to help understand what the allocation requirements will be down the line to kind of ensure that that hierarchy might be in place. Um, we do oftentimes see more executive levels like to get involved in the original planning of the um, account structures as well in that strategy. Yeah, and there's definitely gonna be, or there, there is white papers from the cloud service providers on how to build out an account structure. Uh, the best practice offerings that we mentioned in the episode with Mike, they also cover things like an account structure. So I would definitely read them to get an understanding what are gonna be the pros and cons of the account structure and discussing that with those particular teams so that you know, from a finance perspective, that's gonna be a big no, that's gonna be a mandatory, same as security, and you can start to build that out. Um, what do you see from customers if they have too few accounts, if it's clear that they need more accounts, what are they going through? Yeah, I do see when there are too few accounts, there isn't good enough account segregation. So it's, you see a lot of uh, hodgepodge shared accounts um, with things that, with you know, instances running together that will later down the line make it challenging to kind of manage your costs and, and provide visibility um, and optimizations too. So I do think um, when you do have too few accounts, you have a large shared account uh, population. And you know there are definitely benefits to having shared accounts, but then there's also downfalls like cost management down the line that would become more difficult. And what if they've got too many accounts? Have you seen customers have far too many accounts? 
and that be, be a problem to them? Yes, there are, you know, maintenance things that become a problem. Absolutely. Um, I, I do see that, you know, you then have to give security access to more people. Um, you have to ensure that um, certain, you know, the right number of people have access to maintain and do things like uh, have access to right sizing and, and things like that. Um, you know, so that, that I would say that is the downside to that. But there are sometimes a plus side to it as well that hopefully you have too many accounts because you're separating things out by maybe project level or cost center level. So then later you're organizing well for cost management. Um, again, if you want to read the white papers that are out there to help build out account structures, um, I definitely recommend them. My preference is to go for more accounts than fewer. Um, if you're stuck with multiple workloads, it is an enormous amount of pain that you have to go through to move a workload, or you won't be able to really do your FinOps because all the data is just there together. If there are too many accounts, there's going to be a little bit of extra overhead in terms of um, building, bringing all that data together. However, that's been the case for a few years. The tooling is definitely mature around that. It's a much easier task to bring the data together than try and pull it apart without any information. So we're going to take a quick break and we're going to go to our speed round questions. This is where we ask a series of quick, short and sharp questions of our guests to get them know, get to know them a little better. Sarah, are you ready? I'm ready. Alrighty. And your time starts now. Pineapple on pizza, yes or no? No. Alrighty. Cat person or a dog person? I guess more cat if I had to pick. Red wine or white wine? Um, red. Beer or spirits? Spirits. Uh, do you ask permission or beg for forgiveness? <laughs> mm, beg for forgiveness. Uh, your favorite movie, director, producer, genre, all of the above, any of the above? Uh, favorite genre may be uh, true crime. Ah. Tea or coffee? Coffee. Favorite TV series? Ooh, currently Succession. Ah, yes, I love that one. Um, your favorite, yeah, your favorite song or musician? Uh, that's tough. Um, I would say favorite musician is probably Drake at the moment. Okay, your favorite food, type of food? Um, I'm a big foodie, so that's a hard one. I would say Italian, if I had to say one favorite. Uh, on holiday, do you prefer to do, a oops, sorry. I was just gonna say primarily pasta. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, when you're on holidays, do you prefer to be doing lots of activities or relax and do nothing? Relax. Uh, do you prefer buildings, architecture or nature? Definitely nature. Your preferred superpower, supernatural ability? Uh, okay, so if I could have any superpower, it would definitely be maybe healing after coming out of a pandemic, it would have been nice to have some superpower to just heal everyone with COVID. Nice. Uh, your favorite vacation location? Um, I would say anywhere beachy. Um, so beachy, islandy, maybe, maybe Mexico. Uh, text or talk? Talk, most of the time. Depends who it could be, but most of the time talk. Your childhood nickname? My childhood nickname um, among friends was Little Sarah because I always had a common name of Sarah and I was always the small Sarah. So I'm not very tall if you saw me in person. Your proudest moment? Um, I would say my proudest moment was maybe graduating college. Nice. All right, you've scored a total of 72. Um, I think the lack of pineapple on the cats could have potentially held you back. <laughs> we should start throwing beetroot on the burgers as well in true Australian style. 
All righty. Our next topic, we uh, hinted about it before, tagging schemas. Uh, this has its own dedicated topic because it is that important in case you haven't gotten that so far. So tagging is, as I said, the way that you add business information to your data. That's how you make it relevant. And that is how you're going to be able to ask business questions of your data. Without tagging, there is simply no way to make the right or relevant decision based on that information or really gain any insight uh, and know if you've been successful at what you've been doing as well. So yes, tagging is so, so important. Um, have you seen any customers get away without having a good tagging schema? Um, you know, it's difficult, but I have seen customers, you know, create some synthetic tagging um, to kind of make up for that tagging deficiency. So there are, you know, options available to create, you know, things like business mappings, account groups, uh, depending on the level at which you can later go in and apply logic to kind of go in, pick up the resources that are not tagged and apply some logic to it to get that tagging visibility that you would not have. Yeah. And typically in the cloud provider usage data, there's going to be a resource ID. If those resources aren't changing a lot and things are running for a long time, you could potentially put in a lot of rules. I guess you could get away with it, but it's going to be a lot of work and a lot of pain if you've got a large number of resources in that. Um, and I guess if, you, if you're a very small customer running few amounts of resources, don't get into the bad habit. You could probably get away um, or if you turn over your workloads a lot, if you're always innovating, if you implement new services, well, you could potentially implement tagging. So if you're always refreshing your workloads, uh, maybe you could get out of it by previously not having a good tagging schema. Um, what are the components of a good schema? Sort of technically, non-technically, you know, making sure that they're shared with the right people, everyone has the right input. What makes a good schema and what makes it work in an organization? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, there are options to kind of help standardize um, that tagging. So requiring mandatory tags, um, enforcing it with certain policies. There are cloud vendors that will allow you to implement policies where you can't launch instances without um, certain tags. Um, and so um, I would definitely say technically these are some, some areas to be successful. I would say creating tags that will drive visibility into what's running on the resources. So for example, like having a tag around application name, um, even if there's someone that's gonna be owning those applications, having an application owner, things like that. Uh, definitely having an environment tag. There are several good practice tags I would recommend um, to have that um, you know, good schema, but there are also policies you can implement and like cloud you know, templates that you can use to launch instances with tags. Yep, uh, and I may be showing my age a little bit here, but back in my day when I was a boy, we had 8.3 letters, digits, characters to be able to identify something. Um, these days, tags, it depends on the service provider, things like 10 tags or 50 tags of 10 characters. You can put hundreds, hundreds of characters on, in, in, on information of a tag. There is an enormous amount of information you can put into that. So I would say, again, over-index. Uh, it was painful way back when, when you've got like eight characters to identify something on a file system. It was horrific. Um, Sarah, how have customers effectively enforced schemas? It's great to have one. If no one uses it, not much happens. How do people actually enforce them? Yeah, so, I mean, there are a few different ways that you can do so. Um, you know, like I mentioned, there are cloud providers that will allow you to create policies um, to ensure that if someone tries to launch an instance without the proper tagging, it doesn't get launched. Um, there's also tools out there that will go and, like, sweep your environment to see if there are tags that got, you know, or resources that got launched without tags. They can go and identify, pick that up for you. Um, and so... These are just some of the few options that you can use. Um, there's also, you know, scripts people will use, like CloudFormation type of scripts that can help as well. Yep. Um, and in terms of how do you motivate people? Again, channeling Maddie here. How do you make people care? Do you start firing people that are not tagging? Is there ways to, to help motivate people to actually do the work? Yeah, I do think there are ways to motivate. Like, I think 
having the <clears throat> people that are launching these instances have accountability over their resources from a cost perspective can really incentivize them to launch things with the appropriate visibility in my eyes. Um, because if they know they're gonna down the line be responsible for optimizing their spend or you know, providing visibility to stakeholders on what's on their resources, this will incentivize them in my eyes to, to have them tag those resources. Yeah, I've seen some some customers implement things like big red buttons, terminate everything that's not tagged. Um, can can be painful. Um, if that's done frequently enough, you're going to catch it very soon after creation. So that as soon as it's created, it's terminated. You haven't lost much work by doing that. It may be painful in the short term, but it's really going to lead to adoption of better practices. It also enables you to become more operationally efficient at the end of the day, shut down everything that has, you know, the non-production tag on it as well. It allows for those things to happen. Uh, so the benefits are enormous. Do what you can to implement tagging as much as possible. Okay, on to permissions, access restrictions, controls. So you've got all your information, well, you've got your data, you've enriched it, you've got information. Now you can start to do things like controls, making sure people have access to the right data and resources and they don't have access to things they should not have access to. Now, I love to think of the cloud like a beautiful sports car. It's got great performance. Users love to play with them and experiment. Without the right skills, training or coaching, it's going to end in a very expensive disaster. So you've got to be careful here though, if you take away the keys and people can't experiment with the latest tech and innovation, chances are you're going to lose things like your talent. You're not going to have a happy workforce and you're not going to have people with that desire to actually innovate. So there's going to be some policies you can put in place to restrict usage, uh, things like the unsung hero limits. That's sort of the, always the catch all. If you're doing something really crazy, you're probably going to hit a limit. And if you're hitting limits continually, you know, you're either an extraordinary different customer for some reason, or maybe you need to do things better. Um, what are some controls that work well that, that stop this abuse of cloud that you've seen? Yeah, that's a good question. I think definitely restricting services to a level of people that make sense, right? So for example, identifying what individuals need to have access to which services, um, that way they are able to deploy things that are within their scope and not really outside of their scope and they have that flexibility. Um, also maybe things like having an instance family preference where you can only launch you know, a specific instance family so they're still able to explore and dabble but maybe not at too much of a costly large instance family type. Yeah. And I mean, things like regions as well, that's, I think by default, some of the service providers are doing that now. You know, we run everything in this particular reason. Maybe it's for data sovereignty issues. First things first, lock out all other regions. Uh, so yeah, I like that approach, starting with region, going down to service, going down to resource types, going down to resource sizes. There's different ones. Um, what are some controls that you've seen don't work effectively in customers? that either lead to, to friction among the workforce or still allow problems to happen? Yeah, I think definitely the number one one that I see is maybe not giving all people uh, that need to have access the ability to go in and change instant sizes, for example. This can make it hard when you're going into a right sizing initiative because, you know, not the appropriate, the appropriate people don't have the access to go in and right size these instances to a more effective instance size. Um, I think that's number one. Um, and also another one that I, I think is uh, one that can be holding people back is um, the ability to have access to purchase uh, reserved instances, for example, of, you know, great uh, optimization tasks. Yeah, I could never imagine somebody restricting access to, I guess if you're centralizing discounts, you'd want to make sure there's a, there's a good seamless process to be able to, to purchase things like those commitment discounts. Um, are there places that need more focus than others? Uh, you know, things like production accounts versus development accounts or particular teams that maybe need more controls than others? Definitely production accounts, yes. Um, I see that um, as for sure, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and I would probably also say in terms of, I mean, things like development accounts, you want to have a low amount of controls. Uh, if it's there to experiment, it's a sandbox, it's a playpen, make sure they can play with services, maybe put some limitations on size so they don't go crazy with a new service um, and make sure things are shut down after hours. If it's a new service, they may not be aware of the cost impact. So be cautious around that. So what we'll do now is cut for a mailbag questions. This is when we read the uh, questions that have come to us from our previous episode with Maddie. Hi, and welcome to the mailbag for episode number two. This was the episode that we had with Maddie talking about how to get set up from an organization perspective. So let's go through the questions. First question, what do you do if FinOps is not a priority at your organization and you can't get exec sponsorship on board? Um, the first thing is I'd really look uh, at yourself. You know, have you done absolutely everything you possibly can, uh, making sure that you're really presenting it to the organization, making sure that you understand and providing the value from the correct perspective. So really question yourself, make sure you put yourselves in their shoes. Have you articulated the value, not just financially, but for everything in the organization, looking at what the organization actually does? Um, and really done everything, get a second opinion, speak to some peers, speak to other people that have been in similar situations. Uh, and if you've done absolutely everything and they still don't want to prioritize it, um, honestly, it's not a happy answer, but I would get another job. Um, it's going to be a pretty bad job. If the thing that you love, the thing that you're passionate about is really just not being put in the light that it should be at an organization organizations are screaming out for FinOps professionals. Uh, it's a great area to be employed in at the moment. If they're not going to value you, um, I would definitely go somewhere that would be. Think about security. If you're at an organization that does not care about security, there's going to be some pretty dark days ahead uh, and it's going to be no different from FinOps. Um, there's lots of opportunities out there, lots of new jobs with organizations. Go somewhere where you're going to be cherished and be able to do the thing that you're passionate about, assuming that you've done everything that you can. Uh, the second question, how do you improve tagging and labeling across engineering teams? This is the one that that's normally sticks out. We covered it a fair bit with Sarah as well in this episode. Um, it's going to be coming down to helping to make sure that they can solve the problem for you. As an engineering team, they've got certain tools, they've got certain processes that they need to adhere to. This just needs to be another one of those tasks, making sure that they can actually solve it. Try not to impose a particular thing on them and dictate how they should do it. Here's the challenge ahead of you. You need to be able to tag according to this, solve that problem. I would also make sure that they have the appropriate resourcing in terms of time and anything else that they need to be able to solve it as well. Uh, people are gonna be screaming at them for features and all sorts of bug fixes and everything else. Give them the time, give them the resources so that they can solve it in the most efficient way for engineering. Then you're gonna have the most efficient and optimal solution for that particular team and it shouldn't be as much as a problem. How are companies handling shared costs? Uh, this is a really good one. There's a lot of work in the FinOps Foundation at the moment around shared costs. Uh, so there should be some very good content in that area. First of all, I love to tell people to really just settle down. Um, allocating shared costs is something that has not been done very well at all historically. It's just that you could never really see it. Uh, I used to be a networking guy, so I love to give a networking example. If you've got a 24 port switch, it's a piece of hardware, there's 24 connections on it. When that's purchased, that'll be purchased under a specific project. In the spreadsheet it goes, it's paid for, it's done by that particular project. Uh, a year later, if somebody comes along with a different project and plugs something into another port, do you then reallocate all of the cost of that hardware to the new situation that you've got, you know, one port for the new project and maybe 10 ports for the old project? What about the cooling costs? What about the electricity power costs? Are they automatically reallocated the instant that you plug something else into that switch? No, that never happens. It's always just misallocated to that first project. So you never really did it well. It's just that with cloud, you can now see how misaligned and how badly costs were allocated. It's that you've got so much more information to be able to fix a problem that is always there. So step number one is to relax and don't panic. You always did it badly. It's now that you have some information to be able to attack it. Uh, it's gonna vary a lot depending upon the amount of cost and how critical it is. 
I would always baby steps through to the end. The end goal is to always allocate costs based on how much you know actual usage that system is contributing or revenue uh, to your bottom line. Step one, maybe look at usage elsewhere. Maybe look at the amount of compute, the amount of database, if that's easy per customer. Maybe just do a flat division. I've got 10 customers, one tenth of the cost for everyone. Um, start small and then build accuracy throughout. There could be an area where it's uh, diminishing returns to go much further. So again, make sure you understand the problem and then slowly bit by bit chip away and get better. Don't try and solve it perfectly the first time you do it. It's a hard problem. It's one you haven't solved before. Uh, next question, which FinOps activities do you typically see teams automating? Right sizing, tagging, hygiene, resource management. Um, I'll take a politician's answer and dodge this. I, I really don't like to see, I, I wanna automate my right sizing and my tagging. If you've got problems and you need to do a lot of right sizing and tagging, then you've got a problem elsewhere in your organization. Building systems, creating code that you have to manage to fix a problem that shouldn't be there is not the right approach. Things like right sizing, tagging, you need to solve that problem naturally so that it's not something that keeps popping up. Don't build and add complexity and systems and cost to fix something that is fundamentally a behavioral problem. So I would not like to see uh, things automated to fix problems that shouldn't exist. In terms of automation, um, there's the stock tooling, things like dashboards, getting insights, processing information and data so that it becomes more insightful. That is the stuff that should be automated. Getting information, processing, so that's valuable to you and the organization is probably the thing I would focus on. I would not like to see as much focus on automating fixes to problems as there currently is. That is a business and behavioral problem. Spend that effort and time fixing the behavior. Stop it from occurring to begin with. Don't get caught in the waste cycle where you're creating the waste, paying for the waste, finding the waste, fixing the waste. Um, because it's just a lot, of, a lot of time spent that you could be doing something more valuable. And finally, how do you promote FinOps adoption at your organization? Hopefully there's a sales department within your organization. Um, get them to sell it for you. Um, in all honesty, but understand how sales works. If you wanna sell something to an organization and promote it, understand there is a sales component to that. Make sure that you're understanding your customers, which is your organization. What is your organization trying to do? What are its priorities? Why are they the priorities of your organization? What does it do as a core of its business? And how does FinOps fit into that? How does FinOps drive those priorities, contribute to those priorities uh, and solve it? It should be hopefully a pretty easy sell because FinOps saves a lot of money, which in these times of course is great. It also accelerates anything that you are trying to do by minimizing rework and waste. So it should hopefully be a good sell. Again, make sure you understand the organization as a whole. It's not just a financial thing. FinOps is behavioral change. You're gonna be selling FinOps to engineering teams as well, uh, product teams. Make sure you understand their business, what they do and how it can contribute to them. Have that full picture across the organization uh, and yeah, hook up with sales and get them to do it for you. All right, so that's the mailbag for today. Back to the episode. All right, and we're on to our last topic, configuring tooling. So we've got all of our data sources, we've got our account structure so we can bring all the data together. We've got our tagging so that we've got some information. We now need to start to configure tooling. There's gonna be an absolute enormous amount of data. As we've mentioned before, you're gonna potentially have billions of lines of information. That's a lot of information, but it's also a lot of opportunities that you can act on, refine and get better. Um, Sarah, when customers are configuring their tooling, um, who's the audience for the tools? Obviously the people that are implementing using the cloud, but there's gonna be other associated teams, like of course finance. What are the main audience? What's the main audience of the tooling? Good question. Yeah, so oftentimes we see, you know, the, the audiences usually are, you know, architects, DevOps people, database engineers. Um, we're now in a world of FinOps, so there's definitely sometimes there's organizations that have a cloud center of excellence where they have a team of people that are responsible for managing costs. Um, finance people for sure need that visibility every month when the cloud bill comes in. So I would say these are really the primary 
um, stakeholders. Um, sometimes you do see executives, but they're usually more um, interested in the reporting level uh, aspect of tooling. Yep. Yeah, nice. In terms of the audiences, who needs a lot of access to tooling? Like if you're going to build tooling, who's the sort of first people you should focus on you know, to make the tools for them, so to speak? I would definitely say whoever is responsible for maintaining the resources um, and, and making the decisions on, on you know, what needs to happen to, from, from a maintenance perspective. Yep, so making sure it's configured geared towards you know, the, the DevOps people essentially, excellent. Um, and what are the features of tooling that make it a great fit? Uh, you know, without these particular features, organizations struggle. So you know, the ability to have great visuals, customized visuals, security to restrict certain data, maybe of a secret skunk works department. What are some of the typical features that have make things really useful? Yeah, definitely having those things like CloudWatch, CloudTrail is enabled to, to have data analytics um, and tooling around what is running, where is it running, how much is it costing, uh, you know, tooling that's going to give you visibility into like your CPU memory network um, and, and that type of traffic. Yep, excellent. So a lot of depth. Um, myself personally, I'm not really a fan of things like alerts. Um, they're great to have as a backup, but, but I don't like seeing customers focus on making sure they've got alerts on everything. If you keep getting alerts and alarms, you've got a people problem, you've got a process problem, you need to fix that. Uh, if you're using alarms to drive your organization, you're always going to be you know, an eight hours a day behind fixing everything up instead of doing everything correctly. Um, and what areas of tooling are the particular areas of FinOps or areas of tooling that really give great returns like, okay, you've sold me, I'm going to build my tooling, I'm going to focus on the DevOps people. What are the features of that tooling? I want to get to them first. Yeah, so so things that I would say are, you know, kind of that low effort, high return um, type of tooling are definitely things, in my opinion, that will um, enforce tagging um, and it, it's going to help you have the visibility you need later. Um, so I would say definitely that would be number one for me. Excellent. And again, we, we hear tagging come up again, so please focus on tagging. Um, <clears throat> and what area of tooling is maybe a little bit more painful to set up? There may not initially be benefits, but long-term it's mandatory. Is there any areas which people sort of defer and put off far too long and that you've just got to get them done? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, things like a CMDB um, that has the data that is um, of everything that's going to be running and kind of that one central point of truth, creating those internal policies um, to, to say this is how we're going to do X, Y, and Z. Um, and I think these are things that are really going to help with the long-term success. So you can understand the state of the environment and the changes that are happening. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Excellent, all right, well that is a wrap for our third episode of FinOps Friday. I would like to thank Sarah for coming along and joining us. Um, if you've got any feedback, you've got any questions, feel free to email us at feedback at finopsfridays.com and we'll of course address that in the mailbag in the next episode. So don't forget to subscribe to catch up with future episodes. Have a nice day and thank you, Sarah. Thank you, thanks for having me.